remain curious. Be a lifelong learner. Commit to learning something new every day, yeah. right? Don't get so hung up in that inner dialogue that you have going between your ears, yeah. right? Don't listen to all that head trash. Keep it positive. Rick, I have known you for many, many years. And in all of these years of knowing you, I've always been impressed with the variety that you've been able to do in this music industry and how you have been able to stretch your skill base and your desire to want to learn more and continue to grow and go from performing to management to presidential positions. It's been amazing to see what you have done. And I must say, in relatively a short amount of time, what you've done here. Thank you so much for joining us here at the sessions. Thank you, Dom. Yeah. Happy to be here. Tell me where it started. I know your dad had a music store and uh, he played trumpet, I believe. Yeah. He had a music store in West Springfield, Massachusetts. Great trumpet player. Still playing. Fantastic. He actually, right now, he's like posting stuff of himself singing and playing on Facebook. <laughs> and he's building a little audience. <laughs> I grew up inside his music store from a very, very young age and saw what he put into his craft of playing the trumpet and also what he put into his craft of teaching. He's a fantastic teacher. You know, he taught privately and he put out some great students that went on to do some great things with some great bands. It allowed me to also uh, see how he was as a contractor. So now he had his music store, he taught lessons, and he was a contractor. So we had these multiple revenue streams <laughs> that were coming in, you know, so that we could afford those cans of Franco-American spaghetti. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was a staple at our house. <laughs> you know, we would jazz it up with a little hamburger. You know, that was our version of Italian back then. Yeah, there. Well, times were, times were different years ago, for sure. So when did you start playing drums? Uh, I started playing drums when I was uh, eight years old. And how I got into drums, actually, I started playing trumpet when I was four. And he had me in the Arvin's book when I was four years old. Mm. You know, uh, and I was doing okay with it. And I had an accident when I was eight, broke my arm. He thought that after I got the cast off, he asked me if I wanted to also play drums because he thought it would be a good way of rebuilding my left hand. Very interesting. Yeah, Very and, so smart. That's, and that's how it started. And it just so happened at that time, that's when the Beatles were hitting, right? So everybody wanted to, to be the Beatles. And it's amazing the influence that they had. Yeah. Many, probably a large percentage of people that I've interviewed go back to that day in February of 1964 when the Beatles hit. It had a huge impact on, on us. You know, actually, I didn't think they were going to be a big hit. <laughs> so, <laughs> but Ringo had a huge impact, you know, on, on so many yeah. drummers, in, including myself. Did you start taking lessons at the time, drum lessons with different yeah, teachers? I took, yeah, I took lessons right out of the gate. One of the guys that I studied with actually was a drum student of George Stone, a guy by the name of Dominic Dianni. Yes, right? I know Dominic and, very and well. And David Dianni is one of your students. Yes, his son, yes. Right? So I studied with Dominic for a long time, and so I learned the, the George Stone technique. Interesting. And then when I finished with Dom, I went and studied with another guy by the name of Joe Raish. Mm. And Joe was Joe Morello's best friend. And Joe also, back in the early 60s, late 50s, early 60s, had a club where we would hold these jam sessions. Mm. And Joe Morello was part of the jam sessions, as was Chuck Andrus, great bass player, yeah. as was Phil Woods. <laughs> All of those guys were from my hometown. <laughs> right? So there's a pretty good uh, musical scene happening back then. That's amazing. So you're taking lessons, you go into some of these jam sessions and, and, and playing. When did you start working with musicians and starting to play and interact? I started playing professionally when I was 13. Nice. Right? And my dad had a 60-piece uh, youth band that he put together. And we had four drum set players playing simultaneously. We worked out all of our routines for all the songs. We were doing the Stan Kenton, Count Basie, Duke Ellington stuff. Yeah. And then my dad would do some arrangements of some of the more pop things that were happening at the time. And it, it, it was a great experience. So I started playing professionally when I was 13. I started playing uh, circuses when I was 14. And I played the Moscow Circus first U.S. tour, I did the last two cities of their first U.S. tour in 1971, 
you know, we had a Russian conductor. We had a six hour rehearsal. And by the time I got the book, and it's the last two cities of the tour. Yeah. The, you know, the book was this thick. And by the time I get the book, it's all marked up. It's a lot of railroad tracks, a lot of eyeglasses, <laughs> a lot of blood. So personal yeah. comments yeah. from people. Yeah. Like, oh my gosh. And so this Russian conductor, he didn't speak any English except for two words. Foxtrot and waltz. So I guess <laughs> technically three words. Uh, Fox and waltz, right? And so the way that he set up the band, because he wanted, me, he wanted me to be able to see everything that was going on, he put me in the front of the band. And behind me was the saxophone section, then the trombone section behind the sax section, trumpet section behind the trombone <laughs> section. And so the Moscow Circus was a single ring circus as opposed to like Ringland Brothers, which had three rings with yeah. three different acts. So yeah. just focus on this one act. And this one night we're playing this, what we call a still trapeze with acrobats and they're doing their tricks and their flips and so forth. And so as they're doing the thing, you know, it's a big grandiose piece of music, you know, ballad. Shut up! I catch the act. Shut up! Catch the act, right? And then it's one night, the trumpet section drops out unexpectedly. Then the trombone section drops out. And then it's a drum solo, and it shouldn't be a drum solo. And I turn behind me, and there are two bears fighting where the trombone section used to be. And on long leashes, getting, you know, they were staging for the, the, the next act, and apparently they had a little disagreement over billing or something. I don't know. But they got into it and rolled over into the band. Then the band was gone. And, and nobody said anything to me. <laughs> I, I'm just, still in therapy. Right now. I don't want to talk about it anymore. <laughs> so drumming has taken you to experiences that these are incredible stories. And I know you've got a million of them, which is amazing when you think about doing that experience, playing the circus. Then you went on to, was it Ringling? You, you went on to do, also do some shows for? Yeah, after I got out of high school, I went into the Air Force Band. Mm -hmm. And I did four years with Nor the NORAD band, North American Air Defense Command What a band. sharp band this is. That was a great band, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, great yeah, musicians. Yeah. After I got out of the Air Force, I joined Ringland Brothers. And mm -hmm. what had happened was after I left home, uh, my dad ran away with the circus. <laughs> 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 he closed up the store. They came to him and asked him if he wanted to conduct the blue unit. By this time, I'm, doing, I'm into my third year uh, with the Air Force. And at the beginning of my fourth year, he called me up and they had a, a drummer that had been doing it for a long time. I think his name was Don Gwynn. And it was a great drummer. But Don had been doing the show for six years and wanted to get off the road. Yeah. My dad called me up and asked if I'd be interested in, in doing the show when I got out of the Air Force. I said, yeah, let me think about it, you know. Because I was thinking about some other things too, <laughs> some other potential opportunities. Anyways, decided, yeah, I'd like to do it. He said, great, when do you get out? I said, well, February of the following year. He said, well, but we're in rehearsals in November. <laughs> I said, so, okay, let me see what I can do. And as it turned out, the band's program was going through a 10% cutback, and I was able to work it out, so I got out like the week before rehearsals started for, for Wrangling. What was that like? Because not only do you have to work on a, on a thick book of music, yeah. but there's also, you know, living on the road with the circus. As a musician with Ringland Brothers back then, you could get... A state room. A state room in the train. <laughs> right? And I had uh, my wife, my first wife and I were newly married at that time. But we could have a state room. <laughs> and I found out that a state room is six feet by seven feet. <laughs> and I like my wife okay. <laughs> but that's, that's tight quarters. <laughs> so we went out and we got a fifth wheel travel trailer and we, we uh, traveled with the show that way. So you follow the show as it was moving. You had a little bit more space to live in, in yeah. the process. So you were able to at least keep, keep your, give your mind a break as far as yeah. what were the rehearsals like with the, with the circus? Well, what we would do is we come into a town and we had five musicians that traveled with the show and we hired 10 musicians locally, hmm. right? And so, uh, with the exception of uh, Madison Square Garden, we did 11 weeks there hmm. where we hired 17 musicians because back then they had what they called building minimums for the musicians right, with the union. Yeah. So but normally we hired 10 guys locally and 
as soon as the show was being set up physically, we were doing a rehearsal. And so we had an hour and a half to rehearse a three hour show. <laughs> and then it's downbeat that night. So we had to have guys that could really sight read. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, the first year on the show, you're playing the major cities, and you can always get great musicians, yeah. pretty much. And then the second year, you're playing some of the smaller markets, and you get some of the weekend warriors, right? And you always had that one lead trumpet player, <laughs> right? And, and his way of warming up, like, started with double high Cs to impress <laughs> his buddies. And then we get into like 30 seconds into the rehearsal and his chops were split and he was done. <laughs> <laughs> but you had to have great musicians and the first couple shows, musically, uh, there were a few oops, but then the band would grasp on. So the nucleus that we had had to be extremely tight. So your reading, and I, I know your, your reading is it's excellent. You have a real understanding of, of music. So who'd you study with to kind of give you those reading chops and the technique chops that you have. I mean, you're a phenomenal player. Where'd that all come from? A lot of it came from, first of all, playing with my dad, nice. right? And, and also studying with Joe Raish. And then Joe took me, he said, listen, I've taken you about as far as, as I can, so I think it's time for you to either study with Joe Morello or Ed Shaughnessy. I made the decision that I wanted to study with Ed Shaughnessy, yeah. right? And so I saw this little article in Downbeat Magazine about a National Endowment for the Arts Travel Study Grant. Mm. I'm just like 14, I went ahead and sent away for the application. <laughs> I got the application, filled it out. I never told anybody about it. And then I was like one of 28 people in the country to win it. <laughs> that gave me some funds to be able to take the bus down to New York, three and a half hour bus ride down to, down to the city, yeah. get down there early, always find some street musicians to hang out with, and then I'd go take my lesson with Ed, right, at uh, Henry Adler's. Henry Adler's on 48th Street, I think it was, or? 136 West 46th Street. Well, 46th Street, <laughs> <laughs> that's fantastic. And then, you know, Henry's store was like three steps down, and then there was a staircase that went up into this hallway, and in this hallway, it was very dark, and there was like one light hanging from the ceiling. <laughs> it's, it's like, you know, a place where you would take people to interrogate them. <laughs> you had this lineup of uh, the keyboard mallet teacher by the name of uh, Doug Allen, mm -hmm. and then you had Ed Shaughnessy, yeah. and then you had Joe Casadas, then you had Sandy Feldstein, yes. and then you had Sonny Igo down at the end of the hallway. Beautiful team of people. Oh yeah, yeah. so yeah. this was all pre-MI, pre-Drummers Collective, yeah. you know, but th there was this, this collection of yeah. great teachers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I studied with Ed for two and a half years before The Tonight Show moved out to California from right. New York. And I also was studying mallets with Doug Allen. Mm. You know, I used to say to Doug, Doug, how, how should I practice these, these modes? <laughs> and he would say, a six pack. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I'm like 15 years old. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> After I take my lesson with Ed, and of course we spent a lot of time on reading, we spent a lot of time on technique. Mm. And then every other week, I would walk over to the Tonight Show over at uh, Rockefeller Center, yeah. right? Go up to Studio 6B. And the, back then they had the seats behind the band. Right. right? There's right. a portion of the audience that was behind the band. So I sat there for the music rehearsal for whoever was gonna perform on the show that night. Yeah. And the, so the band was running through the tunes and the guys on the band back then, uh, of course you had Ross Tompkins on piano, Richard Davis was playing bass. Yeah. And then on the trumpet section, and I was right next to the trumpet section, sitting next to Ed, was Snooky Young and one of the regular subs on the band was Clark Terry. Yeah. Right, and so it was, it was great because these guys, great they got used to seeing me, this yeah. pimple-faced kid, every other week. So they would start talking to me. Ed would have me do some charts with an album, right? <laughs> Work on that, and Snooky would say, let me see that album. Yeah, man, I'm on this album. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember uh, one night with, uh, with uh, Clark Terry, uh, or one afternoon, you know, and Clark, he asked me, so tell me about your cymbals. So I would tell him about my cymbals, he said, the high frequency, the low frequency, you know, and so you know, I tell them what they were. He said, you know, because you know, there's certain frequencies 
that I don't like to hear <laughs> when I'm playing solos. It bothers me. It really bothers me. So he said, when you're working with other guys, you might want to just check to see how those cymbals are feeling but what and are advice. being heard by the other guys in the band. Great advice. Yeah. Really. Right? How powerful. And at that time, you know, understanding Ed Shaughnessy, Ed was an incredible reader, big band player. He could yeah. do anything, a saint of a person yeah. in the process. But having had that chance of being with him, this was, it must have been a great, great time in your life. Uh, it, it was incredible. Yeah. And he was a great teacher and a great friend. Yeah. You know, we ended up being lifelong friends, really. Yeah. Now the, then the show moved out to L.A. The, yeah, the, the show moved out to L.A., and so I, I continued down that dark hallway <laughs> to Sonny Igo. Sonny, another phenomenal, phenomenal big band player, beautiful, beautiful person. Oh, yeah. He, he was a, a, an incredible teacher, yeah. and it was, you know, a, a little different than Ed in his approach. Mm. And then one day, I had to go down to my lesson the, the, the next day, and I got the flu. I was sick. I was, it wasn't pretty, right? <laughs> and so I called Sonny up on the phone. Sonny, Rick Drum. Yeah, Rick. I, I can't make the lesson tomorrow. I've got a temperature of 102. I got the flu. I'm th throwing up. He said, oh, hey, Rick, let me ask you a question. This thing that you're doing with the drums, do you expect to make a living with it? I said, well, yeah. <laughs> so you plan to get married one day? I said, yeah. He said, think you might have kids? I said, yeah. <laughs> and he said, you know, when you're a musician, the only way you get paid is if you actually make the gig. <laughs> I said, yeah. He said, see you tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> that was Sonny. <laughs> he was a military guy. He was a Marine. He really yeah. understood, understood the game. And of course, his son, Tommy Igo, yeah. has gone on to do fantastic things with himself with his career, which is, which is oh, incredible. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Tommy and I became good friends you know, much later on in life. How great. How great. So at this point on now, now what was next? Uh, well, I had a, a gig right out of high school for about a year, a road gig. Played around the country. And then that came to an end, and I went into the NORAD band, North American Air Defense really Command Band. I was stationed in Colorado Springs, again, with these great, great, great musicians. So I had to play, of course, the jazz band and also the concert band and the marching band. Thank God for the jazz band because the other two things were a little iffy at times. <laughs> they put me on mallets. I had said I'd study with Doug, but it wasn't a big focus for me. <laughs> <laughs> so I had four great years there yeah. with NORAD, and then Ringling Brothers came along. I got off the road with Ringling Brothers. You know, we did 1,100 shows. That's an amazing amount of work. That's an amazing. You know, each show, three hours of pop. Yeah. And that's actually where I made my connection with Remo through Lloyd McCausland. And uh, Lloyd also used to work with my dad all the way back. Wow. From the same area of town that where, where I grew up. Remo needed heads to be tested. And I was literally playing 40 hours a week on that show. So they would send product out. I would test the product, I would write up these little reports, send them back the product, and they'd send me more stuff. And that's how my relationship began with, uh, with Remo. So after about a year of doing the show, I went to my dad and I said, Dad, this is gonna be my last year. In that environment, musically, it's a, it's a tough gig, and you're only playing bits. I said, Dad, I gotta play a whole tune again. <laughs> And it can't end in a B-flat chord. It's like, you know, everything else that we did, that's the, that's the way it ended. Every night, 1,100 shows, three hours of pop. <laughs> and that's a lot of drum rolls. Yeah, it sure is. <laughs> so you made the move to California at one point to work for Remo? Yeah, my first wife and I, we had a brand new daughter, moved out to California, and I didn't have a job. So I went to, to Lloyd and I said, uh, I need a job. <laughs> you have anything? And I said, well, yeah, we have this entry-level position. It's in customer service. I said, sign At me up. Remo Industry making drum heads, you're now working customer service. Right, I'm working customer service. And I was a good fit for that because I grew up in my dad's music store, took care of customers. I knew what the retailers expected and so forth. Yeah. So it, it was a natural fit for me. I saw opportunities within the factory. And I also, at the same time, I also was curious. That's the big thing. I was really curious about what went into designing a drum head, making a drum head, 
how it got into the hands of the customer, what happened if something wasn't right, mm -hmm. the whole cycle of the product. So I started asking a lot of questions. What I would do is come in at six o'clock in the morning. I wasn't supposed to start till eight. Mm -hmm. So I'd show up at 6 a.m. and then I'd go home at 6 p.m. <laughs> Human resource people would come to me and say, well, you can't do that. You need to, you, you, I said, I'm clocking in when I'm supposed to clock in. They said, no, but you can't be here because we would, legally you're supposed to pay you. I said, I don't want to be paid. <laughs> I just want to learn, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, they went to Remo to actually complain about me. <laughs> and, and Remo turned to him and said, leave the kid alone. Obviously he's interested, just leave him alone. It'll be all right. <laughs> Good for Remo. <laughs> yeah. And so I saw some opportunities and I just filled them without asking. Remo observed that. And then he started giving me a few things to do, right? I'd been there for about a year and a half, two years, and he came up to me. I had that front desk in customer service. He said, hey, Rick, let me talk to you for a minute. We haven't been doing a lot of drum clinics. I said, yeah. He said, we really should be doing some drum clinics. I said, yeah. We had the, the pre-tuned drum sets at the time, and we're trying to get them off the ground. I said, yeah, Rima. I said, that's a great idea. He said, yeah, I think we should do one soon. I said, oh, really? Uh, like, like where? He said, New York City. Oh yeah, that's great, New York. Yeah, man. Who are we gonna have? Who, who do you think we should have? Said, I think we should have Louis Belson, Billy Cobham, and Vic Firth. I said, man, that's a hell of a lineup. <laughs> and I said, uh, when do you think we should do it? He said, 30 days. Put it together. <laughs> All right. So I had been to one drum clinic. I saw Roy Burns clinic <laughs> back in Springfield, <laughs> Massachusetts. But th that's my only experience with a drum clinic. I said, okay. And that's the only communication I had from Remo. That was it. That was my direction. First thing I did was I called Louie, Billy Cobham, and Vic, and I got a date that was going to work for all three. And then I said, okay, now i got to find a place. <laughs> <laughs> so I called the New York uh, uh, Commerce Department, right? And I said, look, uh, we're doing a drum clinic. They said, what is that? You're going to fix drums? Or? <laughs> I said, no, I had to explain what that is. And I said, I need a place that can hold a few hundred people. So they turned me on to the Sheraton. Midtown. So I called them up. I got a, a rate for the ballroom. I got it approved by Remo. And then I knew I had to get people there. So I made up these posters and I sent them to Manny's and all Sam Ash. New York stores. Yeah, yeah, all the New York stores, right? And then I used to be a, a member of Local 802 Musicians Union. In New York, yeah. yeah. And so they used to have this answering service. I saw I think Jane or something like that, right? And so I called them up and said, I want to leave a message for all the drummers in the local that we're having a drum clinic on this date at the Sheraton Center with Louie and Billy and Vic, blah, blah, blah. And said, okay. So they, they put that message out to all the drummers Incredible. in the local. Then I went through Remo's Rolodex. And then I, I called up Max Roach. Uh, I called up Sonny Igo. I called Mel Lewis. Mm. I called... Charlie Perry, Charlie Persip. I went right down the list. All the of New them. York all, based all the drummers. New York guys that I, that I was aware of. I didn't really know all of them, but a couple of them I did. Yeah. And I just, Remo would like to invite you to this thing, right? And so now it's, it's time. Vic shows up early. Remo's got something else to go to that, that evening, it's the night before. And he, he says to me, uh, Rick, I want you to take Vic out for dinner. I was uh, okay, Remo, but I didn't even have a credit card then. <laughs> I never had a credit card up to that point, right? <laughs> so he said, just take my card. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> so I take the card. Says, uh, Vic, you, you want to have dinner? Yeah, okay. I said, well, where would you like to eat? So it's like Sardi's or someplace like that. Right? I said, oh, oh, okay. So I had no idea about the pricing. I didn't do nothing. <laughs> so I take him over. We sit down. We have a great dinner, we have a bottle of wine, and then the bill comes, and he saw my face. He, you know, I, I, got, I, I turned white because, <laughs> like, the bill came to $65. <laughs> and I never, I never had a bill for that much for food before. <laughs> and Vic says, Rick, why don't you let me get this? Oh, no, Vic, no, this is not Remo, we got this, right? So then I sign up, give the guy a tip, and then the next morning I meet with Remo, and uh, he said, how was dinner? I said, well, it was really good, but the spending got a little out of hand. I really apologize, Remo. He said, how much was it? He said, $65. He just 
burst out in laughter. <laughs> <laughs> Gave him back his card. <laughs> so, anyways, the event turned out to be a very successful event, and everybody I invited, except for one person, showed up, and he told me he couldn't make it, and that was Elvin Jones, because hmm. he was going to be on the road. But everybody showed up, and I never told Remo about this, hmm. or what I had done. And so he came up to me, and he said, so what'd you do? And I said, well, you know, I took him through all the steps. And then, like two weeks later, I was... Um, artist relations manager, <laughs> <laughs> along with uh, the customer service. And then eventually I just kind of worked my way up through the company until I became director of sales and marketing globally. So you had, uh, these are important qualities, you had this incredible curiosity yeah. about manufacturing a product, yeah. and you had this perseverance to kind of keep pushing forward. I think that's what Remo really kind of saw in you, yeah. that you had some really strong business qualities that you might not have realized at that time. Right. But he for sure did. Yeah. You're at Remo, you build up to the Remo. What happened after Remo now? You move from Remo and you go to? Uh, Midco International, Midco, which was one yeah. of our customers. They're a distribution company mm -hmm. in Illinois. They made me CEO of that company. So again, I was kind of thrown into the deep end because uh, I didn't have that level of experience, but they liked what they saw. Yeah. And so they gave me this opportunity. And it was the same thing. You just kind of grow into it quickly. Right, right. right. Immerse yourself. Learn to ask questions. Yeah. And, you know, a couple of things there was that I think I attribute to, to my success up to this point was I was never afraid of asking how. Yeah. I was never afraid of letting people know, I don't know how to do that. <laughs> how do I do that? <laughs> to, you know, ask for help. Yeah. And if I screwed up, and I did many, many times, they never hung me. They let me have that opportunity to fix it. Right, which was huge, which was a big confidence booster, yeah. right? And so later on in my years when I had reached that level and also being a mentor to people coming up that, that worked with me and the other companies, I remember those lessons. And well, Very important qualities of, of being thrown into the, into the business world the way you were. Yeah. You were at Midco for several years? I was at Midco for three years, and then I was at a Percussive Arts Society convention, P mm -hmm. uh, PASIC, and Midco had a booth. We were importing these African djembes, right, out of Ghana. Mm -hmm. So we were displaying those, and I went to get a cup of coffee. <laughs> and so I'm walking back to my booth with my cup of coffee, and Vic Firth pops out from his booth. <laughs> hey, Rick, how you doing? Great, Vic, how you doing? Hey, listen, let me hit you with something out of left field. How'd you like to come be president of my company and run my company? <laughs> I mean, just like that. I said, well, you know, maybe we could find a room, have dinner. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so, Rick was like that. He was, he was a direct person for sure. Yeah. So it, it took us a better part of a year to be able to achieve that because as much as I wanted to do it right then and there, uh, I had Mitko going through some transitions that I wanted to see through to the end. He respected that. Mm -hmm. I joined Vic. And again, we had a great team there, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. Great development team. Yeah. We had a great team up at the factory. You had Dave Crocker, who I think is still there as yeah. the engineer. We had uh, Neil Larvey, right? And um, Chuck Moulton. Yeah, and great. of course, uh, Vic's daughters, Kelly and Tracy. And it was just, it was a good team. Yeah, great right? people. Really good great, team, great really good support. We grew that company uh, almost triple during my, yeah. my tenure there. But it was, again, it was getting, having the right people in the right seats at the right time. And it was 10 years, uh, about, right? It was uh, nine years, nine years of, it might have been 10, yeah. Close to 10 years of you doing yeah, this. Yeah. So, so you're in that position now. So now your, your skill base, you're still playing along the way. So your skill base and the balancing business and balancing performance, is, right. which is amazing. So now, what happened when you went to Dario? Well, what happened was actually everything up to this point which I failed to mention, is I have zero college. Hmm. I had not gone to school, yeah. right? I mean, right out of high school. Well, I had one, a full boat scholarship to North Texas. I chose not to take it hmm. because I got a gig right away on the road, and I figured, well, this is what I'm going to be doing anyway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, at 18. Who knew, right? <laughs> I mean, you know everything, right? <laughs> Halfway through my tenure at Vic, I decided to go to college. I got my undergrad degree in business uh, through Southern New Hampshire University, mm -hmm. right, with a lot of it being online, a little bit brick and mortar. And the thing that I really liked was at the time, everything I learned, I could apply the next day. Mm -hmm. 
right? I was not a great high school student. <laughs> I was just into the drums. That's all I wanted to do. Yeah. Right? So I didn't put in the time and geometry and physics yeah. and all this other stuff. I, got, I did enough to just basically get by. Yeah. I remember one time I brought home a, a report card in the month of February, my, my sophomore year, and I had to give my report card to my father, and he said, are these your grades or the temperatures for the past week? <laughs> 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 so if I wanted to continue studying with that, I had to make honors, which I did. Amazing how that worked. <laughs> Going back to school, it was no longer abstract for me. I knew where to put the lessons learned. Right. And as I was doing my, my last year at Southern New Hampshire, I made the decision that I wanted to go for my MBA mm. in entrepreneurship at, at Babson College. I'm finishing up, this is uh, 2005, I'm finishing up my first year at Babson and I'm still managing Vic, the yeah. uh, Firth, the company. I get a call from a recruiter asking me if I would be interested in becoming president of Diderio and interviewing for that job. Yeah. And it's a much larger company, about four times the size of, of Vic yeah. at the time. And so I said, yeah, I'd be happy to go talk to you. I went down to New York. I met with him. He thought I would be a qualified candidate. Then I met with various members of the board of directors. And so I met with three of them. The last guy was the CEO of Massport. His name was Craig Coy, and he was with the he had been with the NSA during Iran Contra. <laughs> so, you know, so that's the, they brought him in after 9/11 to um, fix the security at Logan Airport. Hmm. And so uh, I met with him at his office over at Logan. I, and that was over lunch, and then I drove back to Vic, finished out the day, and now I'm driving home. I'm on Interstate 95, heading home, and all the traffic. I get a call. It's from Jim Diderio. How'd the interview go? I said, Jimmy, I think it went fine. Good, I got one more interview for you. <laughs> I said, Jimmy, I've already given you all my best stuff. <laughs> I got, I've got nothing left. He said, you got to do this one last interview, but I think you'll like it. Uh, okay, so that's on a Monday night. Well, he says to me, on Wednesday, I need you to be in Boston at 3, three o'clock to meet an interview with Jack Welch. Now, Jack Welch, you know. <laughs> this is was, huge. Right? He had been CEO of General Electric. Yeah. You know, he was kind of like the Miles Davis of business, yeah. right, for the, for the 20th century kind yeah, of thing. Absolutely. I had to go to his house to, to interview him, uh, to, to be interviewed. The interview lasted like an hour and 15 minutes, and I was amazed at his grasp of all the facts for the music industry, that's where we started in the interview process. Mm. And he wanted to know what I felt uh, the opportunities were for Diderio. What were my visions for the music industry? Where, where were the opportunities and so forth? So we talked about that. And then we migrated into his world of hiring, firing, mentoring, you know, building companies and yeah. so forth. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, it lasted about an hour, 10, 15 minutes. And he finished up and said, I think you're going to be a good fit for Diderio. You know, go have fun. That's how he ended it. <laughs> and then I had brought a book with me, one of his books, Winning. And I said, to Jack, could you sign this? Because nobody's going to believe I was here. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, from there I got the job. And I was at Diderio for, for eight years. And it was a good run. You know, uh, we grew the company. Uh, by 60 some odd percent during my tenure there. Yeah. And uh, that was during the recession. So again, great people, great crew. And uh, we made a lot of changes within the organization that benefited the organization. But it seems like all these past, this past lineage of what you've had kept on preparing you. But I'm excited about what you're doing now as far as the coaching. Talk about the coaching now that you're doing for several different companies worldwide. Yeah. So. At the end of my eight years, it was time for me to ride off into the sunset. The next generation of Diderios were ready to, to fill in those spots. Yeah. And so I had given quite a bit of thought to becoming a business coach. And as I looked back at my career of whatever the 30 some odd years of managing companies, I realized 
that with each one of those companies, I ended up being that number two guy after the owner. Mm. And, I, and, I, and I was the person that helped the owner achieve what they wanted with their company, mm. right? Whatever the, the growth results were, profit results, and product introductions and things like that. And yeah. I, that part I really enjoyed. Mm. But after spending all that time in a single industry, I wanted to expand because I had all this experience that I thought could benefit other entrepreneurs and their, their teams to achieve what it was that they wanted for their companies. Right, right. And so right now, I've got about 20 clients and I've implemented into about a total of 30 companies. Uh, we've grown these companies by an average of 21% year over year. Mm -hmm. And it's been, a, it's, it's, it's been a great experience for me. I've got 25% of my clients in the music industry. 75% of them have absolutely nothing to do with it. I've got a company that's been building bridges for 114 years down in Alabama, you know, that's based in Alabama. Two construction companies in Bermuda. One is building the new terminal, helping to build the new terminal in Bermuda. I've got a construction company up in Manhattan. I've got three different pharmacy chains. I've got an insurance company. I mean, and, you know, a couple of music retailers yeah. and a guitar company. Sabian, yeah, right. It's fantastic One of my to see clients. what you've built this here. So you'll work with these companies yeah. and help them to enhance not only the growth of their business, but even the people that they have in each of the seats that are there. Do you have the right person? Do you have the right vision? Right. So first, what we work on is: Do we have the right structure right. for the company? I don't tell them what the structure should be, but I facilitate them arriving to what the right structure is right. for their company. Right. right? And then once we have the, what we consider to be the right structure, do we have the right people in the, in the organization to fill the seats that we've structured with the five or so roles in each of those seats? Mm -hmm. So could they really do the job, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And we, then we work on core values for the organization. You know, does everybody share those core values? Because when you surround yourself with people that share your core values, yeah. work is just a lot more fun. Life is a lot more yeah, fun, absolutely. and it becomes a lot easier, absolutely. right? Absolutely. So we have a model, it's called the Entrepreneurial Operating System, and we, we have a model with what we call the six key components, where we work with the vision, making sure the owner and his leadership team is 100% on the same page, going in the same direction, right. knowing how and why right. they're going in that direction. Right. Then we work on the structure and the people, getting, the, again, the right structure, right people in the right seats, then the data. What are the five to 15 key performance metrics that we must have our thumb on to know that the company is achieving what we want it to achieve? Yeah. And then, you know, as we are working on those, we're smoking out the issues. The, you know, so I, I wear this, this shirt, <laughs> you know, what's your issue, <laughs> right? It's your problem, barrier, obstacles to success, maybe even an opportunity that you're not able to take advantage right, of. Right. And we have a methodology of drilling down to find the root cause of that issue. Because once you actually discover a root cause, you can come up with a solution, implement the solution, and have that problem actually go away forever. Beautiful. Right? Beautiful. And then we identify the key core processes for the company, document those, right? It's kind of like bringing somebody into the band <laughs> and tell them, what are we playing? <laughs> Bossa. What are we playing? Rock. But it's amazing that you say that by, by, by having the musical influence, that helps some of your business influence, and they really relate to each other as far as some of the disciplines in each one. Big so time. talk about entrepreneurial rhythms. Well, entrepreneurial rhythm is a company that you and I have put together to teach business principles, business practices through music mm. like take for example learning to work together as a team well when we're playing in ensembles that's the greatest level of teamwork yeah. that you can have right yeah. when we're listening to each other right it's a little give and take yeah. and we're really in tune there's nothing greater than when the the ensemble is really together yeah right yeah and you found the groove right and that's Essentially, in business, it's the same with when you've got a great team, mm. right? And then when you're talking about business, about taking risks. 
what do we do in music that shows <laughs> levels of risk, yeah. right? I mean, uh, improvisation. Absolutely. Right? I mean, because when you're improvising, you're kind of putting it out there. Yeah. And in some cases, you're going down some paths. Maybe some paths are a little riskier than others. <laughs> and when you look behind you, hopefully the rest of the band's with you. <laughs> right? It's the same in business. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. So it's, it's learning these types of skill sets. I'll give you one other. What's the most important skill set that we must have to be successful in music? What is the one skill that we must develop to a very high level to be successful? The ability to listen, yeah. right? And so actually when you're managing, there's this rule where you, you want to listen 85% of the time and talk 15% yeah, of the time. Right. Well, it's kind of that same way in, in music that we've got to constantly listen. And in business, it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. If you want to be successful, you must learn how to listen. Mm -hmm. Right? You must learn how to play well with others. Yeah. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Right? And so it's taken all of those lessons and then teaching businesses how they can succeed through the same lessons that we learn in music. Boy, it seems like you have done that so great in your leadership roles that you've had. You've listened to people and you pull from them these ideas and then found the path, a clear vision, and how to implement them. Right. That's very, very powerful. You know, there's a, a large group of young students that listen to these interviews and a part of what the session is about is to try to reach these kids to give them the hope of what they're trying to achieve with their career and having a plan so in closing what would you say to this next generation that is listening to listen you have been through an incredible amount of experience what could you share with them that could give them this opportunity that they can grab onto to pursue their dreams first listen <laughs> second remain curious be a lifelong learner. Mm -hmm. Commit to learning something new every day. Yeah. Right? Third, don't get so hung up in that inner dialogue that you have going between your ears. Yeah. Right? Don't listen to all that head trash. Keep it positive. Mm -hmm. Next, surround yourself with people that share your values. Because mm -hmm. they're going to become your tribe, your support system. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Don't be afraid to make a mistake. Take risks. That's okay. You know, because what do we do every day when we're learning how to play a musical instrument? We fail. Yeah. If we're pushing ourselves, we fail. But what, what else do we learn? We can recover from that failure with a little more practice, yeah. right? And practicing with purpose, right? All of these things, all of these lessons, all of these fundamentals that I'm talking about, they don't teach you in college. Yeah but they will help you succeed in music and whatever it is that you want to do with your musical career and they will help you succeed in life. How powerful. I know you've done some teaching at some colleges. This is exactly the method they need to hear and it's exactly what our team who listen to these videos need to hear to understand the points that you mentioned. I think they should write this down. They should put them loud and clear in front of them because this is what will absolutely guarantee their level of success. On behalf of the session, Rick, we thank you so much. Keep it going. Thank you, Dan. <laughs>